So hello everyone and welcome to the book club across borders session number eight. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the book um, and I hope that this book has been uh, a solace to you in these brave times and through literature you're able to find some corner of peace and hope. And on that note, I'd like to listen to the first summary that you have of the book. So, uh, and we can continue our conversation from there. So whoever from uh, Kabul's side would like to start the conversation, Kabul, over to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello and good morning, Alia. Nice to meet you. Um, I read the book. It was not too interesting for me, but it worth it reading once as uh, our nice instructor, Mushtaba Juya, told us that if uh, a book is not interesting, even uh, it can be something inside it that you learn. Uh, I read it not with a lot of interest, but with some. And um, the thing I liked about the, the book was it's a thing and then uh, something I want. There are thousands of books written on it's a special way. Uh, can you uh, the, can you hear us, please? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, did you uh, listen I, to what I said? No, I didn't get what you said. Could you please repeat? Okay, I'm gonna repeat it again. Okay. Um, I said that I did not like the book a lot. It was not so interesting for me, but it really worth it reading once. Uh, as our instructor said that if uh, there, a book is not interesting for you, it can have messages, it can convey things that you learn something from inside it. Uh, well, I started the book. Uh, its name was The 99 Nights in Logar. The number 99 is a special number in Persian and in Islamic countries because uh, uh, God has mentioned his name 99 times uh, in Quran. I, I thought it should be a religious book, but uh, while I started it, uh, I God that no, it is not so religious. It is somehow. But then the thing I li liked about the book was its folkloric tales. Uh, it was um, uh, saying mostly for, uh, by uh, the boy's father. Uh, it is uh, its main message was how uh, war influences people. As Plato says that War is something that uh, humans cannot avoid it because it is in their soul and blood. And uh, it uh, unfortunately uh, directly influences people's lives, the way they work, the way they live, uh, uh, their cultures, uh, how they treat. Um, and um, it was mostly uh, somehow about how it influences uh, children and uh, can you hear me did you understand what i said Okay, uh, then I wanted to say something about Afghan fathers, you know. Uh, it was something I wanted to say at the last session, but I think I forgot it. <laughs> and now I want to say that um, each children wishes to have a Superman while he or she is a child. I had myself Superman and that was my father. And the Afghan father or fathers are very powerful, you know, they're a kind of, uh, uh, they have a kind of violent beautiness that uh, each children wants to have a father like uh, an Afghan father with his powerful arms, the stories they tell us. I am sure in no part of the world you can find that uh, way of uh, being a father. 
and it has its bad uh, sides also, but it is really pleasure and things for listening to. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, so I found 99 Nights in Logar a very interesting read. And I'll tell you why. For me, the book had two very fascinating elements. One, it was, it was a work of fiction for sure, but it had so many, um, you know, levels of adventure and, uh, um, you know, like uh, parallel worlds that I found it really, really uh, enthralling especially the relationship between the, um, the main character of the book and the dog that they had and how the dog literally took over a super a natural element. A lot of incidences that were mentioned in the book were uh, obviously not humanly possible, but could be imagined from the, uh, from the mindset and the thoughts of a child. So these were the kind of things that I have always found very, very fascinating, right? So I understand that you generally like to read books which have a strong message where you feel that you're learning, but I would definitely encourage you to read um, softer literature as well. Literature which takes you away from what is happening in the world around you at that moment in time, which kind of, uh, you know, um, which lets your imagination, you know, grow and prosper and create a happy space for yourself, especially when you're living through turbulent times. You know, when I was little, I used to read Enid Blyton a lot, okay? Now, she is a British author that um, my generation, people who were growing up in the 80s and the 90s were very, very, um, it, was, it was a literature that was very popular in our time, right? And obviously, it has... Uh, sort of Harry Potter and, um, you know, those books took over later on. But for me, I remember I used to read these uh, stories. They were called The Enchanted uh, Woods. So there were these, um, it was about a tree and this whole world that existed inside the tree. Okay, they were pixies, they were gnomes, they were these um, uh, mushrooms which were actually magical and then there were these creatures which were like there was this Mr. Moon face and I as a child completely believed that to be true and that got my magical fantasy going you know and a lot of times even today when I feel very dark or very um you know, lots of times you always want to be optimistic and positive, but sometimes life pulls you down. It is just the way it is. I still find solace in my childhood literature, you know, and this world of make-believe where I oftentimes find myself exploring realities which my adult self knows there is no relation to it, right? But there is something very, very um, pleasant and something very, very calming in finding literature, which is not always about um, philosophy or theology or current affairs or politics, but also be able to go through literature, which kind of provides you a sort of a third realm, you know, a parallel universe, a happy place. So um, I'm so glad that you actually went ahead and read the book, even though you did not find it very interesting. And I would definitely encourage you because you're a reader, I know. So I would definitely encourage you to pick up literature, which is slightly different. I don't know, like, you know, I have a daughter who's 14 years old and um, she doesn't like to read much, okay? So I always have been encouraging her to read and she her taste in literature is quite different, right? So when she was little, when she was about 11 years old, I gave her um, Little Women and she read it and she was just like, whatever. I think she just went through the book, but she didn't really get it. During the lockdown uh, a few months back, 
she picked it up again and she read the book and she was like mama it's such a fun book and then she wanted to discuss who did it. when i was reading the book as a child which was the sister that i thought i was and who did she think she had most in common with and so it got us thinking and got us imagining ourselves and then she went around and she picked up gulliver's travels okay it was a book again that you know as children we had read and she really started enjoying herself you know and now she's back to reading uh, books like um one of us is lying and you know the more current popular literature but i did think that often times you need to take a break from the kind of literature that you have been consuming because often times it makes your um thought process very one track and you always need to have your imagination going so that you can have a more holistic attitude towards your reality you know what i mean so i would definitely encourage you to to read a uh, more literature which is slightly different you know you read the sea prayer as well it was a work of uh, it was an illustrated book which was based on real events but it also had that element of fantasy you know so fantasy often times is something that we need to have especially to go through tough times so do pick up literature which would get your imagination going and we will discuss the book further and i'm hoping that by the end of the session you will have more um you know you will have more um i wouldn't say respect per se but you would have more tolerance for literature which is which is different you know what i mean So on that note I would love to ask anybody else from Afghanistan who read the book and hopefully enjoyed it and can tell us more about it. Uh thank you Alia. I think I also shared some of your thoughts with um uh, Wahida when she said she didn't really, you know, like the book. It wasn't too interesting for her. um and i think the book you mentioned what was the name of the book about the magical mushrooms and stuff was it like alice in the wonderland because i also read that book when i was a child and i really loved that book i used no. to live in a book like that so no it wasn't alice in wonderland it was um there there's this british writer she was a very she's a very famous author for children's book her name is enid blyton and uh, she uh, wrote this series which was called uh, one of the book was called the far away tree then another and it had a series the first one was the far away tree then there was mr moonface it had five um, sub categories uh, five books in a series and basically what it talked about was this little girl who was growing up in um, the countryside in in britain and she had a tree in one of the forests that was close to where she lived and that tree wasn't an average tree the tree was alive you know the tree um when she went inside she realized that it was a world in itself so there were creatures there there was this there was this one character he was his name was mr moonface who gave her cupcakes and cookies and cream and he was a small man but she realized that even she was smaller so it had those elephant wonderland um aspects but it had nothing to do with like you know dorothy being lost or or alice being lost or something like that it was more to do with our imagination and the whole concept of fairy land right so there were these pixies and there were these gnomes and and then there were these magical uh, concoctions and so it was like you know how kids in the west have um uh tree houses So it's like yeah, yeah. a tree house kind of a um concept and you know I used to have a huge tree in my house like a really big tree right and I told my dad that I need to have a small house here because you know it's I I'm telling you dad you know there's a world there that needs to be friends with me and my father was like okay and he actually built me a small tree house and I could climb up they were like 
I remember there were these like ledges on the tree that I used to climb up on when I was little. And um, after me, my brother's children, they also enjoyed it to quite a large, large extent, you know. And uh, so oftentimes, like I said, it is at trying times or at uh, testing times that these little things provide us with so much comfort that we didn't even realize that we needed, you know. So oftentimes, like one of the things, like I am a total, total believer in fairy tales, in, in uh, childhood tales. Like I remember there was this book, it's a Persian literature. Its name is Tilsame Hoshraba. It is known as the largest collection of fairy tales. It's written in Persian and it was very popular in the region. I'm sure if you, if you search for it in Afghanistan, you'll find um, popular narratives of it. And uh, my dad, when he was younger and going to school, he was taught Persian. So he could read Persian very well. And he had read this book when he was little. So when I was growing up, he would tell me stories, right? Um, I think every father tells his uh, daughter stories. And he would tell me stories about these um, creatures who were jinns and these uh, fairies and these princes and these... Um, you know, kings and these kingdoms that were coming from far away, all the way from Persia, all the way from Egypt, and you know, the whole Muslim empire, it kind of connected it and talked about the, the Himalayas, the Hindu Kush, the mountain ranges that surround us. And it was such a good way of getting my imagination going. So I feel books have a very, very magical power. They have the power to educate us. They have the power to comfort us. They have the power to open our eyes to different ideas, to different thoughts, to different um, things. Like um, these days, I, um, when I was growing up, I did not explore our own literature much. And one of the things that I'm most grateful for, for getting the opportunity to do book clubs across borders is that I got to explore our literature. And I have found so much amazing stuff and so many awesome authors that I would love to recommend to you guys to get hold of and read. And yes, that is more heavy stuff, like in the sense it's, it's more about uh, spirituality, about uh, the way people in this region have developed their thought process and have evolved as, um, you know, as more specialized beings, especially in terms of our evolution of a mind. So um, I feel oftentimes books give us that insight. So I'm, I'm very fond of, um, you know, exploring different genres of literature. So on and, that note. Um, yeah, you can share the name of the books you have uh, with me. I'll share them with my students. I will just definitely a little bit on what you said about fairy tales and the books about fairy tales. Uh, I would also like to recommend my students a book. Uh, you might have heard about it. It's called A Thousand and One Nights. Uh, in Persian, we call it Hazar Yaksha. Uh, yeah. It's also one of the books that I really loved as a child. Uh, and, I, and I used to think that these are all realities. However, they were not. And somehow they were keeping me you know, away from uh, you know, all the difficulties, you know, that I had in my life as a child. And I used to go to that book as a way of escaping, you know, the reality. So I do recommend all the students who are all here to read Hazari Akshab. Wonderful stuff. Now I'd like, to Ali, uh, I'd like to ask Ali to come and share what he thought about the book. Yes, Ali? <clears throat> Thank you, Alia, for uh, your thoughts. Uh, hi, Alia. Good morning. Uh, oh, I have a question about the book. Was it a fiction or non-fiction? Which book? The 99 Nights in Logar. So 99 Nights in Logar. Um, if you guys have questions, okay. So we had the pleasure of having Jamil John Kochai as part of one of the sessions where we were curating. So if you are all interested, I wanted to play his, um, his uh, interview with you where he talks about the book and why he wrote what he did. If you guys like, I can share that first and then we can continue the conversation. Would that, would that suit you? Sure, how long is that? It's a three, I think it's a five minute clip. 
Sure, why not? Why not? Okay, lovely. So I'm just gonna um, share my screen. Can you guys see? Yes. Okay, lovely. Uh, so I, I grew up here in um, in California in America, but um, uh, but I was born in Pekhawar, Pakistan, and um, and I came to the states when I was um, about one years old, and so um, and so I, I grew up my whole life sort of uh, being told stories about Afghanistan, being told stories about my father's village in Logar and um, and my mother's childhood in Logar, and um, and we would also visit um, from time to time. So when I was six years old, I went to we went to um, Logar, Afghanistan for the first time, and then again when I was twelve years old um, uh, in two thousand five, uh, we went to Logar, Afghanistan again. I spent uh, about four months there, and you know I, I I really loved I really loved the village. I really loved Afghanistan. I really loved the people. Uh, the Avon people, I really loved, um, you know, when I was there in Logar, I felt more, um, I felt more loved and I felt more friendship and I felt more, um, you know, companionship from my, from my cousins and my family members and, um, and the other villagers there that I met in Logar, um, that, that it really just stayed in my heart. It lingered in my heart for a long time and, and these memories stayed with me. And um, and so when as I got older, you know, um, and I began writing uh, at the university here in California, um, the main thing that I the only thing that I really wanted to write about was um, was were these memories that I had of Logar and uh, and of my father's stories and of my mother's stories, and um, and really that that was really the main reason I think I began writing this 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 book was because I wanted to explore these memories again because I wanted to be there. And those times again, um, you know, with my cousins and my friends on the, um, you know, in the roads of the village, uh, swimming in the streams, climbing the trees, um, and uh, and sort of experiencing that again. And um, and so, you know, for for me, it, it almost wasn't a choice. I I felt like I had to write these stories down. One of the most difficult parts of of writing this book was um, was first like the the historical research that it went into the book. You know, I really wanted to. Um, I, uh, in the book, I'm exploring history in Logar and of what happened. Um, you know, in my father's home village in in Logar, Afghanistan, and um, and it was important for me that that I made sure that I got certain elements of that history um, correct. That that. Um, that these, you know, these incidents that occurred, um, that I brought light to those incidents. And, um, and the other thing was, you know, there are also other elements of this book that, um, that are very, that are very personal and that are very, you know, um, precious, especially, um, to my father, certain, certain parts of the book, I'm, I'm exploring my family history and I'm exploring, um, you know, um, very tragic events. Um, the the death of loved ones, the the murder of loved ones, and um, and when I was writing those chapters and when I was writing about those people, it was really important to me that um, that I did justice to those stories, that I made sure that I told like a certain truth about those stories, and so and so I I would make sure I would go and I would interview my father and I would talk to him about these times, and um, and those were I think some of the most difficult conversations that I would have. It's very difficult for my father to speak. Um, for example, about, you know, the, the Soviet war and, um, and the things the you know, the, the killings and the bombings that occurred in Logar at that time. And, um, and, uh, but, but Alhamdulillah, you know, my, my father was very supportive of the book. My family has been very supportive of the book. So anytime I had a question or I needed them to retell me a story, um, they've always been very willing to help. And so, you know, I think without their support, I might not have ever been able to finish this book. I really owe a lot to my to my parents and to my uh, family as a whole. It's really important for me that um, that any of my readers, no matter what their age or what their background or um, or where they're coming from, 
Uh, but I really wanted them to just be able to to enjoy this book. Like it was really important for me um, that this book was funny, um, that this book was was a joyous experience, that um, that that it felt like an adventure while reading this book, um, because I wanted those elements to sort of be as important as um, you know the deeper messages of the book about about war and, and history and violence or whatever else. So I wanted. I wanted the experience of the reading of this book to both be, you know, uh, a joyous experience, but also sort of, um, or, uh, but also an occasion, um, you know, to, to, to be able to reflect upon um, the ways that, that violence or war can alter a childhood. Um, or, or, or also, you know, an in, in, in opportunity to reflect upon our own childhoods and our own memories and the ways that, um, uh, that, that, you know, the ways that, that our own childhoods or our own memories um, have been changed by, by different political circumstances um, that, that have been out of our hands. I wanted it to be a really, um, uh, I wanted it to be authentic and sort of true uh, to, to the voice that, the, to the voices and to the, you know, uh, to the stories that, that I experienced in my own household um, or, or even, you know, in other households. Um, with my friends and my Afghan relatives. And, um, and so that's why, you know, that's why I ended up incorporating those elements of, of Fafil and Farsi and Arabic or whatever else, um, just because I wanted it to be true to the voice that I grew up sort of speaking and hearing. So that was Janine Jan Kuchai talking about the book. I hope that um, answered some of the queries uh, that you had. It is a work of fiction, but it is based on um, events and incidences that Jamil John Kuchai himself experienced. Right? And over to you. Okay, a link. Okay. Um, I found the book interesting to read, uh, but, but there were some challenges. Uh, firstly, the um, names were really hard for me. It was Marwan, Dudabash, Gul. Uh, most of them were bo boys, and um, the characters there was no girl, I think, or if there was, the, and besides that, they were all uh, speaking Persian. Uh, the, the Marwan was couldn't speak Pashto, uh, but it was really a complicated situation because. As most of them were Pashto native speaker, but some of them were talking Farsi. And they were saying that, why don't you speak Farsi? They were explaining things in Persian. And it was really complicated for me. Besides that, in um, the text, the script was very different than other books. It was really short sentences with um, the verbs were in past participle. It was the third form of the verb. And I always thought that it's wrong, this sentence is wrong grammatically, these things. <laughs> but they were not, of course. And uh, I found, I read the last uh, page of the book. It was an, inter uh, an in uh, introduction about the author, about Jim John. And he has a bachelor and master's in English literature from different universities. And that's so uh, prestigious. Um, but um, I, I thought the book was interesting. It was uh, telling a, two stories at the same time, the story of the uh, these kids that uh, they have an adventure and also the situation of Afghanistan logger uh, in years of 2005. In those years, uh, there were a lot of American troops here because of the Taliban. And also that um, logger is really near to Kabul. Um, it's so close to us and uh, it's so dangerous place as it was uh, so well explained in the book. And I really like uh, that fact about Logar and how it was explained in the, that. And um, yeah, they're looking forward to read this next book, the next map. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Thank you. And Ali, just to add on uh -huh. to uh, your query about there being no female characters, there's a very strong female character, um, his aunt, and uh, how much, uh, you know, pull she has in the family. And because he's a boy um, and most of his cousins are men, 
So that's why I guess it didn't weave in. And we have to keep the context of culture in mind. I think that was another reason. For me, the my most favorite character was Budabash the dog. I mean, I just adored him. And for me, Budabash kind of uh, um, embodied the struggle that uh, Jamil Jan was having. Because um, from the first introduction of Buddha Bash till the last one, we almost feel like um, Buddha Bash is not just the family dog, but he is uh, his land, you know? And when he comes, you know, like how he bites him and he doesn't want to be friends with him and all of that happens. It kind of made me realize that, um, you know, what Jamil Jan was feeling that every time he would travel back to Afghanistan, like he was going every, uh, almost every year in the summer to Logar, because that is where his family was. Um, he felt like he wasn't one of them, even though he was one of them, because he would be there for some time as the Afghan from Logar. And then he would go back to America where he was... Uh, an American studying in school, getting opportunities, and he felt that like his cousins weren't getting that um, option. So there was this kind of disconnect um, that you feel, right? So um, I felt like in Buddha Bash, he was trying to embody the spirit of not being welcomed, but he wanted to be accepted. He wanted to be embraced by the family. And that's why he's trying so hard to be friends with him, to take him on as, as one of them. And then we see there is a movement and Buddha Bash kind of becomes friendly with him. And towards the end, the imagination of the reader is left to wonder what happens and what other adventures um, the dog and everyone else takes on. So I thought that was quite interesting for me. And on that note, I'd like to have somebody else from Afghanistan who'd like to come and tell us about um, what they thought about the book and how they would like to, uh, if there are any questions that they have that I would be happy to address. So Kabul, over to you. Um, uh, thank you, Alia. I just wanted to add a little more point. I don't know if you have this problem in Pakistan or not, but in Afghanistan, we have this problem that most of us are like imprisoned in Kabul, you know what I mean? Like we really cannot go to the provinces which are around Kabul. We have so many beautiful places. We have Kandahar, we have Jalalabad, Ogar, we have like Badakhshan. These are very beautiful places and we would really love to experience, you know, going there, traveling, meeting the people, seeing the culture. However, there is a problem of insecurity. A lot of people cannot risk, you know, going there. I just wanted to ask if you have the same problem uh, back uh, in, in Pakistan or not. No, we, God has been very kind to us. We explore the whole of Pakistan very comfortably, especially with the lockdown and the travel ban. A lot of people are going towards our north, which is very, very, very beautiful. We have, like I said, Pakistan has been blessed truly with uh, two of the most wonderful uh, mountain ranges. One is the Hindu Kush that connects us to Afghanistan through Trishmir. And then we have on the other side, the Himalayas, which connect us to, uh, uh, to China and to uh, um, India. So both of these mountain ranges have beautiful valleys and cities which are worth exploring. And a lot of tourist work has been done in these places to get foreign tourism into Pakistan. So the Gilgit Baltistan region, especially places like Swat, Hunza, um, Chitral, they're all uh, places which are open and accessible to us. And then towards the Himalayas, we have um, the Galiyat, which is like places like Nathya Gali, Changa Gali, Kuza Gali, um, Mari, which are all mountainsides where there is wonderful, the hotels, motels, rest houses are fantastic. So you can afford to have a holiday with a limited budget or a very extravagant one, depending on um, your uh, spending power. 
And another thing is that in um, Chitral, we have this amazing place, which is called Shindur, which is the world's highest polo ground. So it's, um, and Shindur has a festival every year for polo. And um, uh, one of the polo, um, in the year 2001, uh, Prince Charles, who's a very, very big fan of polo, had actually come to Shindur for polo. So it is, um, the Shindur Polo Festival is really, uh, uh, you know, uh, you get a lot of foreign dignitaries and royalty especially uh, come in. We have had a lot of our polo players join teams like especially Argentina, which again is also very, very uh, famous for polo. So um, we have these, we have glaciers, we have gushing rivers, um, mountains, uh, lush trees. So our north is extremely gorgeous and um, it is very accessible to us. Uh, people from Karachi can actually drive down. It's quite far from us because we are um, completely in the south and we travel all the way to the north, but the highways and the motorways are fantastic. Uh, thanks to the CPAC, which is the Pakistan-China trade route. And uh, these motorways are fabulous. You drive a car at the speed of 120 to 140. And these motorways are exactly uh, the same motorways that you would find in developed world uh, for um, inter-country inter travel. And uh, they have uh, rest houses, they have these gas stations where you can park your cars, get refreshments. I and my, um, my family, we all took a road trip last year and it was a lot of fun. So um, we are very, very fortunate in that way is that most of Pakistan is open and accessible for everybody. We have oh, buses, yeah, the way you're, trains, the way you're describing Pakistan, you really make us come there and be your guests. Are you going to host us whenever I you come there? Happy to. I would be happy to. Pakistan is always I open for you. We're very really, really lucky. I hope one day Afghanistan can also um, enjoy that freedom, you know, that kind of um, freedom to travel to all its provinces. And let, let's come to Zahra. I think she's been waiting here uh, for some time. Zahra. <clears throat> okay. Uh, good morning, Ms. Olya. Um, so I want to um, say whatever I learned from this book. First, uh, the characters that were in this book um, and the guy who was uh, the author explained the story through his language and his thoughts, uh, Marwan. And um, he was always uh, saying that this place that I have come from a very long uh, place. And um, uh, it's not only a place for me to come and visit. It's, uh, of course, it was his hometown. And um, um, for this reason, he wanted to uh, give lots of joy from that place and being with his relatives. And um, uh, because we know that um, his uh, paternal uh, relatives died during the war, uh, so he was supposed to be in uh, his uh, maternal uh, relative's house. And he was there with his uh, cousins and uncles. And he was um, always uh, speaking with those boys that were uh, in same age as him. And uh, beside that, the, the dog that was in the story, and he um, he was thinking that why is the dog different from the first time he came, uh, came uh, to Logar? Because the first time uh, he was thinking that the dog was not this much bad, but at the second time as uh, the dog bite his finger, and then um, the dog was, um, it uh, changed a lot. And uh, uh, because it was his um, second time came to Logar, um, he had some uh, more programs uh, with himself as well. Because the first time he came to Logar, he mentioned that I forgot how to write in English and I even forgot some alphabets uh, when I, um, I go back to um, America. Uh, so when uh, his uh, uncles and the uh, cousins were in a school or in their works at the day shift, he was uh, uh, trying to um, work on his uh, um, language skill to not forget him, uh, of course, with his siblings. 
and um, he was uh, trying to read some novels that he had brought with him so from America or the, the ones that he could find in his uh, relative's house. And uh, also he had some other activities in the um, uh, locker and um, he went to Bolsar and uh, bought some DVDs for himself and he uh, saw some movies there and he was uh, trying to um, do some things in Logar that he can do in other places like he was playing with his cousins as well and he was uh, uh, going to know about the place he um, that was his hometown and uh, many times he went to the maze that was around their home and we know that he got lost uh, and um, also um, uh, he was also realizing that how much hard it is for um, his um, cousins and uh, for all the people who are living in local, especially children, uh, to come up with the war and also with the bad situation at that time in Afghanistan. Uh, I actually know that how much bad is it because I was born in 2005 and my family were saying that it was not very, um, it was not bad in, in uh, Kabul, but in other places it was still and the, that um, American were there, Taliban were there everywhere. Uh, they were, it was dangerous for the people to go everywhere. It was not safe for them. And also um, the next things that were mentioned in uh, the story was that the, uh, the maternal parents of uh, the maternal relatives of uh, Marwan that were living in uh, Logar, and they were so different for him because he had lived in uh, um, America and the people were there, their behaviors and especially their banquets that the, they had and how they were serving their um, uh, guests. It was so um, interesting for him. Um, actually, he was so, um, it was strange for him at the first, but then he thought that it's a very good way of serving the, um, the guests. And beside that, it's uh, um, everyone's um, inference from that story is different. I think that uh, it tells us that how much hard for um, uh, the children that were in Afghanistan at that time, and also now it is hard to uh, struggle with all the challenges that they have and they are encountering every day. And oh, okay. okay. And um, the last point is that when he returned back to America. And uh, he was supposed to lie the first time he was coming back to America and he lied about his uh, father's job. And uh, um, for the last time that he said, uh, and the, in the Pashto word uh, for, the, all the, for the police that um, came um, in, the way, in their way. And uh, just he said that he asked that, uh, uh, about their father's job and he lied. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Zandra, so much. Um, thank you for thank coming you, and sharing. I'm so glad that uh, you enjoyed reading the book and uh, you actually went around asking your parents about um, what it was like in Logar and other provinces of Afghanistan. It's really, really mm -hmm. sad that um, most of your beautiful country is not accessible to you. But maybe through these books, you can get to know these parts of the world that um, you call home. So on that note, I would love to ask somebody else from Afghanistan who'd like to come and talk about the book. Then I also have some testimonies from students in Pakistan who have read the book um, and shared their thoughts and opinions on, on what they read. And I would love to share those with you as well. So anybody else? Okay, yeah, we will student, who's going to share her opinion. Uh, and then we will hear from Pakistan uh, and from the lovely students of Pakistan. Um, hello and good morning. Um, okay, so I have many opinions about this book. <clears throat> and the first thing, uh, first opinion I had when I first opened the book and I started reading it is that I, I liked how the book is uh, written in open language. I think you can say it like that. And it, with nothing was, uh, no words were censored or anything like other books are. And uh, this book is mostly about Logar and Afghanistan. And I like that because it shows the culture of Afghanistan in the old times back in 2005 where the war was still heated, it was still there and it was not so calm as it is now even though it is still not calm now, but it is much calmer. And 
the story is actually um, I actually enjoy fictional stories a lot because they're you know they're fun and there's it's a different story it's something new and I really enjoy reading stories and I like how in these stories you actually learn something about that place you learn so many characters you learn so many different uh, cultures and like I said in Afghanistan because we were I was a kid at that time and I I wasn't here, so I didn't know much. So I didn't know much about Afghanistan. I didn't know mm, like what the condition was exactly from the mm, from people's point of view. So I was glad to learn about that. And um, as uh, someone who uh, didn't live in Afghanistan for a very long time and and recently came here three years ago. I totally understand Marwan's feelings about coming here for the first time and then being invited by his family and just coming and everyone hugging and kissing and saying, how are you? Are you happy or are you not? And it was, I totally understood his feelings in that case and like how they came and they kept <laughs> eating shorwa every day. <laughs> That was the most funny part for me because I totally understand that part and I felt so sorry for his small brother. <laughs> Even I was so tired of the show. <laughs> so yeah, that, uh, so that's why um, I really like this book and I, I'm, I, def I'm, I feel bad I couldn't finish the book completely because I was really busy this week, but um, I'm I was so happy to read this book and learn something new from this. It was fun to read it. Thank you so much, Shami. Thank you. Thank you so much for those thoughts. And I'm so glad you enjoyed it and could relate to it. Um, anybody else from Afghanistan who would like to come and share their thoughts on the book? Uh, from Afghanistan? Yes. Um, I don't think we will have enough time, Malia, because we're going to hear from you as well. So okay. I don't know. Should I, should I just share my testimonies? Sure, sure, why not? However, we are going to continue our discussion uh, once, you know, this call is done. We always okay. do, you know, before the session, after the session, we still talk about the book. Okay, sounds lovely. So just give me a minute. I'm just going to get my stuff, stuff sorted and get to you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Kanza Muzaffar. I recently read the book 99 Nights in Dover by Jamil Jan Kochai. And I think author's storytelling is very vivid and colorful as told by 12 years old boy Marwan. The story shows his quest to find his dog. Um, I personally think the story and the novel shows uh, it's either a side of Afghanistan that is rarely seen through years of US imperialism. It also shows America's influence on the world. Uh, I really enjoyed learning about Afghani culture through ears and eyes of four young boys, but uh, frequent use of Pashto in the text made it difficult for me to understand what was written, uh, what was written about the story. Uh, I really loved the book and I hope to read more books of um, Jamil Jan in future. Thank you. Greetings everyone, it's me Zaina Khan from TCF College. So um, I read this book, 99 Nights in a Logger, written by Jamil Jan Kochai. I'm going to summarize this uh, book in a uh, few sentences. That uh, 12 years old Marwan and his family uh, traveled from their new home in America to visit their extended families in the Logger province of Afghanistan. 
It is six years uh, since they were last there, and Marwan and his younger brothers rebelled in reconnecting with their cousins and began free to run around. Then Marwan uh, tries to make friends with the family guard dog, Budabash. He has his uh, finger bitten off and the dog escapes. Against family orders, Marwan and his friends, Gul, Zia, and Dao, went in search of dog through the dangerous country where they encountered thieves, Taliban fighters, and US soldiers. Now I'm going to share my opinion regarding this uh, book, that the book does a brilliant job in portraying the tragedy of a nation's history. And yeah, of course, uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading this book. And thank you so much. <laughs> what I had for you guys. Um, and uh, now, Afghanistan, we have exactly, um, I think, 10 more minutes. So anybody who'd like to take the stage and talk about the book, it is open for them. Sure. Imam, why don't you come to as the youngest member? I'm sure you have something to say. Really? What about the result? The result, Tayyiba, um, and other people who read the book. Yeah, you know, why, why don't you talk, Anya? Okay. Uh, what about Mahdi and John? Do you have something to say? No, nothing. Are you sure? You should be full of, you know, words to, to share. Um, so, uh, Anya, uh, as you heard, I think you overheard us. Did you? Okay, no, it's okay. I should have muted myself. It's not yeah. worry about it. So um, I thank you all for reading the book and uh, taking our time to continue this journey with us. I'm really, really glad that I'm getting to know all of you and getting to know Afghanistan through your eyes, which is such a pleasure, which is such a pleasure. And um, all of you feel like home which is something that I'm really, really thankful to for. And I'm very, honestly, I'm very, very grateful for it that um, I am getting to meet some of the most amazing human beings on planet Earth and they feel like family. So uh, for, for me, that is some of, one of the best take homes. And I hope that through us, you getting a, a glimpse into what Pakistan is. And uh, for me, one of the things that really, really bothered me was the myth that we have associated with Afghans and Pakistanis through what we see on the media. So this is giving us an opportunity to get to know each other one-on-one and understand each other and learn to uh, live together um, as neighbors and um, and, you know, followers of the same majority of us following the same religion, um, though both of our countries have minorities, um, have people, I, I wouldn't say minorities, but people who follow other religions, but our religion actually um, promotes, uh, you know, uh, neighboring uh, relationships. Our Prophet Wasallam always spoke about the rights of neighbors and, um, you know, like, if something happens in Afghanistan, it is as if it, as if it happens in our own backyard. So I remember when I saw the uh, the bomb blast, when I, when I heard about the bomb blast in Kabul in the girls' school, um, it completely broke my heart. And my daughter came to me and she said, Mama, did you hear this? And she's a young child, but she felt the pain. So for me, uh, that is what makes me want to pursue doing what we're doing so we can create building because um, it's very easy to break things but it is really really hard work to continue making things so I want all of us to continue our journey of creation and not of destruction so on that note I'm going to say Khudaf is from Pakistan I wish you all safety and health and hope to see you again next month with a new book and many more ideas to share. Take care of yourselves. Be kind to yourselves. Thank you so much. Yeah, our students here also say goodbye to you. Everyone here, um, thank you so much for giving us the floor and the opportunity to share and speak uh, out our minds. Thank you so much.
Take care of yourself. Have a wonderful one. Have a wonderful